Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Jen Rombolski, the director of the La Crosse County Health Department. And I am joined by my colleagues um, from Mayo Clinic Health System, Dr. Fitzgerald and Dr. Kowalski from Gunderson Health System. And um, what we're going to do today is share with you some information about where we are currently um, in our community. So in starting by sharing an overview of our local data, we do have to say that all of our metrics are really deeply concerning at this time. Our case rate has nearly tripled in the last three weeks um, to at present time, we are 109 per 100,000 people per day. Also, our hospitalizations continue to increase with an average of 28 per 100,000 per day. And as our healthcare providers will discuss today in this session, um, this is really unsustainable at this current rate and we, and we need to take action. Um, one in three people are testing positive in our community. More people are dying. 26 of our 32 deaths have occurred since October 1st. Health departments across the state are struggling to keep up with the very large volume of numbers of cases. Um, our goal locally is to reach cases in 48 hours and the health department has had so many cases that we've only been able to reach 61% of that time frame. Um, only 58% of our case contacts have been reached within 48 hours as well. And I just wanna take a moment to say that if you receive a call from the health department, we, we ask you to answer the phone, um, call us back if we miss you. Um, we've heard from community members that they're afraid or not willing to report where they've been or who they've been with. Um, and we want to just reiterate that we're here to help and we're not here to judge. Um, if you test positive, call your contacts and let them know that they may have been exposed. Complete our online form that you'll find at www.lacrossecounty.org slash COVID-19. Um, you can send them even right to that website for more information. The levels of COVID-19 in our community, our county, the region, and the state of Wisconsin are in a crisis mode right now. Wisconsin has had um, record cases, deaths, and hospitalizations in the past few days. The need for action by the community is urgent, and without action, the worst is really yet to come. I wish I had a better message to share, um, but unfortunately, that is the reality at this time. The behaviors that we recommend um, have not changed. They remain the same, but very important. Again, these are the tools that can help us prevent further spread in our community. Number one is to stay home, make plans for a safer holiday. We wanna make sure that we don't have spread in gatherings um, of individuals outside of households. Thanksgiving celebrations um, held between multiple house households are not recommended. Number two is to wear a mask anytime you leave your home. Number three, practice physical distancing at all times as much as possible. Again, these are the ways the virus likes to spread is in close contact with others. Um, wash your hands frequently, avoid touching your face, get tested, be a leader in your circle. Check in on family and friends with a call or online chat. Talk about the importance of following these safety precautions and have the courage to challenge misinformation and share helpful resources. We have outbreaks in our community and at this time we're putting them into three primary groupings. The first is community-based exposures. And these are including um, locations like businesses as our employers, bars and churches, um, school-based exposures, as well as personal gatherings. Those are the three primary groupings. So as an example, in the last look back period over this past week, we have seen a growing cluster associated with a group of individuals watch, watching a Packers game um, at a local bar, as well as um, we've seen a number of clusters related to individuals who are ill attending in-person church services. And the single largest source of COVID-19 transmission outside of household spread this week has been workplace exposures. So some have reported that they feel compelled to report to work even after they are known to be a high risk close contact or a case. Some businesses are trying to shorten or ignore quarantine requirements for their employees and this leads to even larger workplace outbreaks. For businesses and employers in particular, 
The Cooley COVID-19 Collaborative recommends that all establishments please do not shorten quarantine, do not direct any symptomatic or exposed employee to report to work. A negative test result does not shorten a quarantine time period. Require masks indoors and out for staff and all patrons. Whenever possible, allow employees to work from home. Screen employees who need to report to work in person for symptoms and exposures. And bars and restaurants should prioritize offering takeout and curbside service rather than in-person service. Bars and restaurants really should be closed for on-premise on consumption between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. All businesses should limit capacity to 25% of total capacity or 50 people, whichever is less, indoors or out. Cancel or reschedule any large in-person event, sports or gatherings for the next 30 days. Based on spread at schools and universities, as well as churches, we have additional recommendations for those locations and the full metrics can be found on our website at cooleycovid19.org. I'm next gonna turn it over to Dr. Kowalski from Gunderson. Thank you, Jen. I really uh, just wanna give a snapshot and maybe peel the lid back on some of the challenges we're facing in healthcare and at Gunderson in particular. I'm going to share some numbers. Um, you know, here at the Gunderson Lacrosse campus, we've had over 50 patients uh, as of this morning, uh, probably more by now, in our hospital with COVID-19. And across our health system, we are caring for over 70 patients with COVID-19. It's not just that static number that has me alarmed. It is the rate of change. And so let me share this with you. On September 1st, we had five in our system. On September 15th, we had nine. On October 1st, we had 17. On October 15th, we had 28. On November 1st, we were up to 40, and now we're up to 74 patients. That's nearly doubling every two weeks. We cannot sustain that pace. If we continue doubling like that, it is only a matter of time before healthcare is absolutely overwhelmed. We are being forced to, uh, and, and, and required to voluntarily slow elective surgeries that require a hospitalization to ease the strain on our hospitals. We're limiting visitors to our facility to protect patients and our staff. And we've been averaging, averaging uh, uh, approximately 500 of our employees out on a daily basis because they are either under quarantine, being tested, uh, out with the disease, or having to care for family members who are. Um, these are unsustainable numbers. And it's going to, by the trajectories, clearly get worse. Almost all of these exposures to our employees are happening in the community. And it's happening to those who we love the most. I'm going to stop there and pass it over to Dr. Fitzgerald so we can hear a little bit uh, about the experience at Mayo as well. And thank you, Dr. Kowalski. Uh, agree with everything he just said. Uh, our um, experience is similar. So, uh, and again, and the story we're telling today isn't isn't kind of amusing or happy story. It's it's turning into a horror story. Um, as mentioned in our Mayo Clinic briefing, uh, we opened up a second wing in our hospital for COVID patients. Our uh, census has increased, and now we're seeing uh, you know 30 plus patients a day. A significant number of those are in our ICU, and at least one of them is ventilated. Uh, unfortunately, we've had the same rate of rise uh, that Dr. Kowalski relayed. Uh, things have doubled over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and if you look outside of even our, just our own region, if you look just north to our partners up in uh, Eau Claire, uh, there are upwards of 90 plus patients in their hospital a day. Many, many of those are ventilated. Uh, those are the most sick patients and those are the ones that really take a long time to get out of our facilities. Uh, if we change our behaviors right now, we can slow or even stop the march uh, of the increase of the uh, illness that's in our community. And I think that's the ask from uh, both the county and us as healthcare partners, that we really need to change behaviors in the community right now. And you, you've heard us say that over and over over the past um, you know, few weeks to months, but um, all of our greatest fears are starting to come to fruition. Uh, we, we feared that uh, we'd get to the point where healthcare becomes overrun uh, and really uh, our facilities and especially our staffing uh, is not a uh, limitless um, 
um, amount of people and places. Uh, we can run out of those facilities and, and staff very quickly. Uh, right now at, at Mayo, uh, we've, uh, similar to Gunnarsson, cut back on elective surgeries. Uh, we're taking people out of the outpatient practices and repurposing them to hospital, um, mostly because of exposures to staff. And really, in our experience, most of that is because of uh, family members that bring, those, uh, bring the virus home uh, to the staff. Uh, so it's really affecting our ability to care for patients. Uh, we will see uh, not only deaths from COVID, but we'll see deaths from other medical issues that we're not able to address because we're concentrated on, on COVID going forward. And, and if things get worse, people may not get their cancer surgeries. People, people may not get uh, procedures that are uh, really uh, important to their overall health. And, and that's what's really uh, kind of waking us up in the middle of the night. Uh, when you look at the Cooley Collaborative uh, metrics, uh, both health systems are still in the yellow, but I think I'd uh, put a little editorial around that. Um, we are teetering on being in the red. And really, when we look at what it means to be in the red, that means we're going to be taking care of patients in tents, not in hospital beds. Uh, we'll be transporting patients to ICUs that may be hours away uh, for, for their care. Uh, we'll have healthcare workers that out of necessity will have to care for patients with active COVID because we don't have staff to take care of those patients. And, and at some point, uh, if things get bad enough, we may have to ration care. So we may have to take really tough choices about who actually gets care and who doesn't. That's what red means. And that's what we're on the trajectory to get to. And we really need to uh, change our behaviors so we can, can really kind of blunt the rise of this curve and hopefully turn it around to where things kind of fall a little bit. We know there will be some virus in the community. There's already very established community spread, but the rate of spread is absolutely alarming right now. I had one of my favorite ER nurses uh, give me a really good analogy. Working in healthcare right now feels like a firefighter uh, who uh, has a certain percentage of their community think it's okay to set a fire because it doesn't affect them. It might just burn their neighbor. We have another subset of the community who thinks that those fires just aren't real. And we're fighting that fire right now. Uh, we need to get back, we need to get past those narratives. Uh, we are in the point where things are really, really bad and could get very much worse. Um, so we need to change our behaviors right now. And there's, you know, the virus doesn't care uh, if it's passed in church or passed over a Thanksgiving uh, dinner table or passed at a deer camp. Uh, all of these gatherings we really need to stop, uh, stop doing right now so we can uh, get a handle on the spread of this and uh, get our facilities back where we need them to be. Dr. Kowalski. Yeah, I, I really appreciate what Dr. Fitzgerald had to say. Um, you know, those pictures of red, those aren't hypothetical. Those are happening right now in the United States of America. They're happening in El Paso, Texas. They're happening in North Dakota. They have happened and we witnessed them on the East Coast in the spring. And we are at great risk of them happening in the future. Making choices about rationing care is an awful, awful place to be. But, but the choices our community makes in the coming days and weeks can be the one thing that can, can break that trend and, and make that future not a reality. So our, our plea today is really to all of our community members to think beyond oneself, to think beyond one's current situation and to think of, of all of us to help us end what is an emerging crisis in Wisconsin and our region. Think of your family members, your friends, your coworkers, Think of your, your parents, grandparents, think of those folks who have medical conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, asthma, lung disease, people who are at risk to get severely ill. Um, this is not a, a mild flu. This is something that, that is killing record numbers of Americans and the trajectory in our region is deeply alarming. But think about all those teachers and students who've been struggling through virtual learning and wanna get back into school. Um, uh, think about the impact that your actions can have on making that happen. Um, and for all of those who would believe as, as Dr. Fitzgerald shared that this is not a real virus, um, have the courage to have the conversations, to share this information and this data because the fire that was described, it is, uh, this pandemic is growing like a fire does. It starts small. Um, but when it gets roaring, it grows exponentially. And that's what we're seeing in our numbers. And that's what our see we're seeing in our community. Please take action now. Uh, we need everyone all in together to help end this emerging crisis. With that, I'll turn it back over. 
Yeah, thank you for those messages. Um, that's really the content we had to share and we'll take questions from our media partners. Hi, this is uh, Jordan Fremstead from WKBT. This question's for Dr. Fitzgerald or uh, Dr. Kowalski. At what point, gentlemen, do we get to a point where you guys would have to send patients to other healthcare facilities in the state? And what is that threshold for you guys? Um, it's hard to give a, a you know, a, an exact answer to that. Um, you know, it wouldn't, especially as we look at our hospital status, we're already converting floors that wouldn't you know, wouldn't take care of things like COVID to taking care of COVID. So, you know, I think there's still some capacity um, in our in our region. Um, now, things like ICUs uh, have a finite, um, you know, a finite number of people we can take care of from a facility standpoint. But really in our area, and I won't speak for Gunnarsson, but it's, it's the staffing that's the huge issue right now. Um, you only have so many uh, physicians, associate providers, nurses, uh, respiratory techs that can actually deliver care to these patients. We have some of those patient, uh, people who are out on either quarantine or with illness, uh, so it, it makes the bench a lot shorter. Uh, so again, we're, we're to a place where we could get to, uh, get to that very quickly. Um, I can tell you that our very close neighbors are sending patients to us because they're at that point right now. Um, and it's, you know, this is not in North Dakota. This is in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. This is in Green Bay, Wisconsin. This is in uh, areas in our state that they're uh, butting up against their capacity to care for people. Uh, so, um, you know, what we one did not want to happen is, is here in our state, uh, in, our, in our communities. I think our answer would be similar. We don't have a number where we flip a switch, um, but but there is a day-to-day -day, um, reevaluation of who can we take care of, and and there may be a point. In all honesty, uh, the way this is starting to erupt, not just in in our community, but everywhere around us, there may not be a place to send people to, and um, so so we're not we're not at that point yet but we're, we're heading there at a pace that I could, wouldn't have imagined and, and, and wouldn't have in my worst dreams thought of even just September 1st when we were caring for five patients with COVID. Hello, this is Andrea Elbers from News 19. As we talk about capacity for care, I have a hypothetical scenario, which may be a little grim, but I do think it matches the serious tone of, of today's briefing. With hospitals as full as they are right now, hypothetically, let's say there's a catastrophic local event like a major crash in I-90 with the number of people needing medical care, what would happen in a scenario like that? Well, yeah, I I'll think, start and Dr. Fitzgerald can, can jump in. We do the best with the resources we have, save as many people as we have. We have, you know, uh, ethical paradigm set up of, of how, how do we triage and ration care when we get to the point where we can't handle it all? We would use emergency responses in our county and region to try to get as many people to as many other accepting hospitals as there were. Um, but that is probably highlighting the point in a, in a very dramatic single event kind of situation um, that ultimately more people will not survive if we continue to stay on this capacity or this trajectory uh, towards max capacity. Hey, this is Rick at WIZM. Um, Black Friday is coming up. Have you guys talked to some of the big box stores about 25% capacity? And then we've seen, you know, bars outside, outside of bars on Halloween where people are just lining up. I don't know what Black Friday is going to look like, but have you had conversations about just, you know, the idea of having a bunch of people in stores, the 25% capacity, and then the people lining up outside of stores waiting to get in uh, before they open. I mean, this is the communication, Rick, you know, th this is the message we've been, we've been sending for several weeks now, um, and the health advisory specific to 25% capacity, um, and the recommendations that you see uh, us releasing today. Um, you know, one of the challenges is that as individuals who are um, going to those locations, particularly the bar situation, um, when the bar is actually um, 
sticking to that 25% capacity is when we might see people lined up outside um, because they're not allowed inside the facility. So that's where it comes back to its supply and demand. And it has to be both um, and all uh, that are really taking these recommendations seriously. Um, we should not have to call every single box store, every single bar to share this message. This is not new. Um, this is just a matter of everyone doing their part as part of a community to help make sure that we can um, change the trajectory that we are headed on right now. Yeah, I agree with that, Rick. I, I guess what I would add is, um, you know, I, whether it's Black Friday or, or Thanksgiving, anything that's going to have people grouped together where they're within six feet of each other and they're not masking, if they're not distancing, is going to spread this virus. If you are around uh, a number of people in our community right now, there's enough community spread, one of them is positive. That's just the facts of what the numbers are telling us. So, you know, again, I don't want to pick on the businesses that are, you know, that are trying to do their best um, to stay in business right now. But, um, you know, being around a whole group of people is an exceptionally bad idea. Um, you know, we put pretty specific guidelines out around, you know, even, uh, you know, high school sports, club sports, all those types of things. If it's a gathering of people, it will spread the virus. Right now, for a period of time, we need to not do that. This is Andrea Elvers with just one more follow-up question here. We talked about the large number of employees who are out because of a COVID positive test or caring for a family member or have been um, exposed. Do we know of any healthcare um, personnel who are currently sick with COVID-19 and hospitalized locally? Uh, I'm unaware of in our system, any of our local uh, providers or staff that are hospitalized and for HIPAA reasons, we can't really kind of divulge specifics about that. But um, and again, just suffices to say that uh, healthcare um, physicians, nurses, staff, we, we're community members too. So our risk in the community is just as high as anyone else's um, and, and we're suffering from that too. Um, our facilities are safe, everything is clean. We're doing everything we can to not spread this and still care for patients, but we live in the community too. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add a little bit on to that. You know, obviously we can't share specific information, but, but when we're two of the biggest employers in the region, uh, I'd be shocked if there weren't members of our um, organizations that, that weren't some of the folks who were sick or, or ultimately ending up in the hospital. They're not acquiring within these walls of overwhelmingly. That, that's been borne out pretty clear in the data here and nationwide that, that in healthcare settings, when people wear the right PPE, the right gear, if you will, they, they follow the right protocols, could be a safe place to operate. What that, that safety has not translated out into the community and that's where we're seeing our struggles. Um, Hi, this is Hope Curran with Wisconsin Public Radio. My message, or my question is for Jen. Um, I'm just wondering if you can clarify why you're um, recommending that um, bars and restaurants close for on-premise consumption between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m. Obviously, you're asking people to, um, you know, do takeout instead and would prefer that. But can you just kind of explain the rationale between limiting hours? Yeah, thanks for that question, Hope. I actually, because of a state and local health department. Um, session that I had to attend today was not part of that conversation with the collaborative. So I don't know if Dr. Kowalski or Dr. Fitzgerald could, could shed some light on that recommendation from today's conversation. Yeah, I'll, I'll add maybe just a little bit of, of um, general data that would support that. Uh, this is, um, it's been pretty well borne out in, in studies at the national level, at regional level, that um, restaurants and bars are one of the higher risk places for transmission of COVID-19. This has been known for months. It's not new news. Um, and in particular, uh, there have been states, including right next to us that have in Minnesota that have shown that some of that transmission is perhaps even worse in the after 10 p.m. hours. Um, so, so it really comes from a understanding of the data an understanding of what are the highest risk uh, environments that one can be in. And I think that's what what drove that discussion. Um, I'll, I'll stop there.
Yeah, this is Jordan Fremstead again. I just wanted to follow up on staffing. You know, you guys talked about the staffing issues. And I mean, I've talked to nurses in the past couple of weeks. And I mean, one of them said that she dreads going to work every day. It's, uh, is burnout getting worse for you guys? And I guess for you as you know, leaders of your two healthcare systems here in La Crosse, I guess, what's the message to staff uh, so that they you know, continue to come to work? And I mean, how do you handle that burnout? Yeah, that's a great question, Jordan. I, I, I do think burnout is a major issue uh, in our healthcare systems. Again, part of why people chose to go into healthcare is, is you, know, you know, basically a, uh, to take care of people. And, and again, we're asking people to do it even beyond uh, sometimes their regular hours and beyond their comfort zones. We're having folks that are um, having to do things outside of their traditional uh, job descriptions. And, and that's going to get worse the more illness we have. Um, you know, again, it, we want people to be fresh and, and have time off and we're assuring that, but people are being able, are being asked to work beyond their normal um, you know, work week um, just out of necessity right now. Um, we went into healthcare to take care of people. This is part of what you do when you have a pandemic, you, you step up, you don't step back. Um, but again, it's not a limitless resource. Um, as things go on, and especially if things get worse, um, people are going to get tired, and they're going to, you know, by by nature of how things go, um, things can happen when you're not as fresh as you would otherwise be. That just again underscores the importance of trying to get the overall um, amount of uh, virus and illness in our community down, uh, so we can, you know, keep all of our staff fresh and, and able to care, care for patients. Yeah, I, I am deeply concerned about our staff and their ability to continue to um, wade through this challenge. Uh, I, I see in their eyes, I hear when their voices crack and I can, I can um, it's obvious in their body language that we are strained as healthcare providers. You know, I'm an infectious disease doctor and, and, and for me, uh, this pandemic dating back to March or April, it was the frankly, the event of a generation and having to pour tons of energy and time into planning our system responses at that time. But right now, I think the message to our amazing staff is this is, this is our time collectively to rise up, to serve our communities as best we can. We, it is our calling and this is a, really the responsibility and the meaning in this moment um, is one message that we're conveying but also just acknowledging that this is not uh, um, this is not business as normal, and that we feel the, the the pain and the fatigue with it. You know, there are there there is hope. There is a light coming. Uh, we have, uh, you know, from a from an ID perspective, amazing news in terms of the vaccine effectiveness that's coming out just within the last week. So so this this marathon that we've been in and we continue to run we're starting to see that there is an end to it, um, but we, this is the time to double and triple down, serve our communities, uh, really reach our calling that we went into this for. Um, and when we do that together and just show up day after day, part of that faith, we'll get through it, I'm sure, because of the quality of people we have. But it is uh, my number one deep concern uh, is, is the people we work with. Do we have any other media questions for our panelists today? No other questions. So um, as always, thank you so much to our media partners um, for the good questions that you ask, the good reporting that you do, helping us to get this message out um, on behalf of Dr. Kowalski and Dr. Fitzgerald and I and the rest of the collaborative. Um, we appreciate you. We appreciate our community members who are doing the right thing. Um, and, and we really encourage those um, that can do more, do better for our community. Um, there is no better time than now. So thank you so much for your time today and please have a safe and healthy rest of your week.